energy flow in ecosystems supports life and is governed by the laws of thermodynamics. The first law states that although energy can be transferred, it cannot be created or destroyed. When wood burns, for example, the potential energy released from the molecular bonds of the wood equals the kinetic energy released as heat. The second law states that as energy is transferred, a portion ceases to be usable. When coal is burned in a boiler to produce steam, for example, some of the energy creates steam and some of the energy is dispersed as heat to the surrounding air. As energy moves through an ecosystem, much of it is lost as heat of respiration. Energy is degraded from a more organized to a less organized state or entropy. However, a continuous flux of energy from the sun prevents ecosystems from running down. The flow of energy through an ecosystem starts with the harnessing of sunlight by green plants through a process referred to as primary production. The total amount of energy fixed by plants is gross primary production. The amount of energy remaining after plants have met their respiratory need is net primary production in the form of plant biomass. The rate of primary production is net primary productivity which is measured in units of weight per unit area per unit time. Productivity of terrestrial ecosystems is influenced by climate, especially temperature and precipitation. Temperature influences the photosynthetic rate and the amount of available water limits photosynthesis and the amount of leaves that can be supported. Warm, wet conditions make the tropical rainforest the most productive terrestrial ecosystem. Nutrient availability also directly influences rate of primary productivity. Light is a primary factor limiting productivity in aquatic ecosystems, and the depth to which light penetrates is crucial to determining the zone of primary productivity. Nutrient availability is the most pervasive influence on the productivity of oceans. The most productive ecosystems are shallow coastal waters, coral reefs, and estuaries, where nutrients are more available. Nutrient availability is also a dominant factor limiting net primary productivity in lake ecosystems. In rivers and streams, net primary productivity is low, with inputs of dead organic matter from adjacent terrestrial ecosystems being an important source of energy input. There are two types of external inputs of organic carbon in aquatic ecosystems. Autochthonous input is when organic carbon is produced within an ecosystem. It is from photosynthesis by aquatic plants, attached algae in shallow waters, and phytoplankton in the open waters. On the other hand, Allochthonous input is input of organic carbon from outside the ecosystem. This is in the form of dead organic matter from adjacent terrestrial ecosystems entering the water as dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter. In flowing aquatic systems, there is what we call the river continuum concept. Streams derive most of their organic carbon from dead plant materials. As the stream widens farther downstream, Shading by the trees becomes limited to the stream margins. Increase in available light allows for an increase in net primary productivity by aquatic plants, algae, and phytoplankton. Thus, there is a transition from allochthonous input to a mix of allochthonous and autochthonous input. In lake ecosystems, internal and external sources of organic carbon varies as a function of their morphology and the nature of the surrounding catchment. In larger lakes, autochthonous inputs dominate, and allochthonous inputs of dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter vary seasonally. However, in smaller lakes, allochthonous inputs can be significant. Plant growth functions as a positive feedback system. 
reduced moisture conditions result in an increased carbon allocation to roots at the expense of leaves, thus reducing leaf area and rates of net carbon gain. Karen McKinney and colleagues from Australian National University found that estimates of the ratio of below ground to above ground biomass reflect greater allocation to roots relative to above ground tissues through decreasing annual precipitation. Ecosystems with greater net primary productivity are those with greater standing biomass. This is seen in both terrestrial and marine environments. Larger plants generally have a greater net carbon gain or absolute growth rate than do smaller plants. However, comparison of relative net primary productivity with the average standing biomass in each of the terrestrial ecosystems shows an inverse of this pattern. Although net primary productivity of a temperate forest is more than twofold than a temperate grassland, if productivity per unit of standing biomass is calculated, the grassland ecosystem's net primary productivity is almost an order of magnitude greater than the forest. This reflects the pattern of higher relative growth rate for grasses when compared to trees. This is because the longevity of dominant plant species is greater than the period over which net primary productivity is measured. In marine ecosystems, phytoplankton are the dominant net primary producers in open water ecosystems. They are short-lived with high rates of reproduction. This results in a constant turnover of the population, low standing biomass at any time interval as compared to the accumulated net primary productivity over the course of the year, and it accounts for the extremely high value of relative net primary productivity for the open ocean. Photosynthesis and plant growth are directly influenced by seasonal variation. Regions with cold winters or distinct wet and dry seasons have a period of plant dormancy when primary productivity ceases. In the wet regions of the tropics, there is little seasonal variation in primary productivity. Disturbances such as herbivory and fire can also lead to year-to-year -year variations in net primary productivity at a site. Overgrazing of grasslands by cattle or sheep or defoliation of forests can significantly reduce net primary productivity. Fire in grasslands may increase productivity in wet years but reduce it in dry years. Net primary productivity also varies with stand age, particularly in ecosystems that are dominated by woody vegetation. Sith Gower from the University of Wisconsin and colleagues Ross McCurdy and Denise Murdy from the Australian National University found that as the age of a forest stand increases, more and more of the living biomass occurs as woody tissue, whereas the leaf area remains relatively constant or declines. They also found that as the stand ages, rates of both photosynthesis and respiration decline, and more of the growth production is used for maintenance. This results in a pattern of increasing primary productivity during the early stages of stand development, followed by a decline as the forest ages and the standing biomass increases. Net primary productivity is the energy available to the heterotrophic component of the ecosystem. Either herbivores or decomposers eventually consume all primary productivity, but often is not all used within the same ecosystem. Net primary productivity may be dispersed by humans or other agents, such as wind or water currents, to another food chain outside the ecosystem. Some energy in the form of plant material, once consumed, passes from the body as waste products. Of the energy assimilated, part is used as heat for metabolism, while the remainder is available for maintenance, such as capturing or harvesting food, performing muscular work, and keeping up with wear and tear on the animal's body. This is called secondary productivity. It is the net energy allocated to production and is a heterotrophic equivalent of the net primary productivity by autotrophs. Sam McNaughton from Syracuse University compiled data from 69 studies that reported both net primary productivity and secondary productivity for terrestrial ecosystems. He found that the secondary productivity of herbivores increased with primary productivity and that forests exhibit less consumption per unit of primary productivity than do grasslands. Michael Berlinski and K.H. Mann of Dalhousie University examined the relationship between phytoplankton and zooplankton productivity in 43 lakes and 12 reservoirs. 
They found a significant positive relationship between phytoplankton productivity and the productivity of both herbivorous and carnivorous zooplankton. Although there is a general relationship between the availability of primary productivity and the productivity of consumer organisms across a variety of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, within a given ecosystem, there is a considerable variation among consumer organisms in their efficiency in transforming energy consumed into secondary production. These differences can be illustrated using the following simple model of energy flow through a consumer organism. Of the food ingested by a consumer, which is the caterpillar, a portion is assimilated across the gut wall and the remainder is expelled from the body of waste products. Of the energy that is assimilated, some is used in respiration and the remainder goes to production, which includes production of new tissues as well as reproduction. The ratio of assimilation to ingestion, or the assimilation efficiency, is a measure of the efficiency with which the consumer extracts energy from food. The ratio of production to assimilation, or the production efficiency, is a measure of how efficiently the consumer incorporates assimilated energy into secondary production. Assimilation efficiencies vary widely among ectotherms and endotherms. Endotherms are much more efficient than ectotherms. However, carnivores, even ectothermic ones, have a higher assimilation efficiency of approximately 80% than herbivores of 20 to 50%. Production efficiency varies mainly according to taxonomic class. Invertebrates in general have high efficiencies of 30 to 40%, losing relatively little energy in respiratory heat and converting more assimilated energy into production. Among the vertebrates, ectotherms have intermediate values of production efficiency of approximately 10%. In contrast, endotherms with their high level of energy expenditure associated with maintaining a constant body temperature convert only 1-2% to of their assimilated energy into production. Organic compounds fixed by autotrophs are the source of energy on which the rest of life on Earth depends. This energy stored by autotrophs is passed along through the ecosystem in a series of steps of eating and being eaten, known as a food chain. Feeding relationships within a food chain are defined in terms of trophic or consumer levels. From a functional rather than a species viewpoint, all organisms that obtain their energy in the same number of steps from the autotrophs or primary producers belong to the same trophic level in the ecosystem. The first trophic level belongs to the primary producers and the second level to the herbivores and the higher levels to the consumers. Some consumers occupy a single trophic level, but many others such as omnivores occupy more than one trophic level. Within any ecosystem, there are two major food chains, the grazing food chain and the detrital food chain. The distinction between these two food chains is the source of energy for the first level consumers, the herbivores. In the grazing food chain, the source of energy is living plant biomass or net production. In the detrital food chain, the source of energy is dead organic matter or detritus. In turn, the herbivores in each food chain are the source of energy for the carnivores and so on. Cattle grazing on pasture land, deer browsing in the forest, and insects feeding on leaves in the forest canopy, or zooplankton feeding on phytoplankton in the water column all represent first level consumers of the grazing food chain. In contrast, a variety of invertebrates such as snails, beetles, millipedes, and earthworms, as well as fungi and bacteria, represent first level of vegetable food chain. This figure is a combination of the two food chains to produce a generalized model of trophic structure and energy flow through an ecosystem. The initial source of energy from the detrital food chain is the input of dead organic matter and waste materials from the grazing food chain. This linkage appears as a series of brown arrows from each of the trophic levels in the grazing food chain, leading to the box designated as detritus, or dead organic matter. There is one notable difference in the flow of energy between the trophic levels in the grazing and decomposer food chains. In the grazing food chain, the flow is unidirectional, with net primary production providing the energy source for herbivores, herbivores providing the energy for carnivores, and so on. In the decomposer food chain, the flow is not unidirectional, 
The waste materials and the dead organic matter in which the, or the consumer traffic wrappers are recycled, returning as an input to the dead organic matter box at the base of the detrital food chain. In addition, the distinction between the grazer and the consumer food chains is often blurred at the higher traffic levels because predators rarely distinguish whether prey draw the resources from primary producers or detritus. In every ecosystem, every organism is linked through the food they eat and the energy they get from the food. We can follow the energy transfer by looking at the food chains and the food webs. Eventually, the carcass of an animal will provide for the decomposers, thus creating another food chain. This is a pathway of feeding relationships among organisms that results in energy transfer. At each trophic level, estimates of the efficiency of energy exchange are defined as consumption efficiency, which is the proportion of available energy being consumed. Assimilation efficiency, which is the portion of energy ingested that is assimilated and not lost as waste material. And production efficiency, which is the portion of assimilated energy that goes to growth rather than respiration. These estimates of efficiency can be used to quantify the flow of energy through the food chain. However, as we go up the food chain, the energy flowing to a trophic level decreases with each successive level. An ecological rule of thumb is that only 10% of the energy stored as biomass in a given trophic level is converted to biomass at a higher level. The main reason for this loss is the second law of thermodynamics which states that whenever energy is converted from one form to another, there is a tendency towards disorder. In biological systems, this means a great deal of energy is lost as metabolic heat when the organisms from one trophic level are consumed by the next level.